So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jen Watson, and I'm going to be your um, seminar moderator for most of the next four weeks. Um, I hope you're all uh, enjoying Beaverworks. This is your first full day, starting to get acclimated, and you have a really exciting four weeks ahead of you. Um, each week, we're going to have four speakers for you, and you have this incredible opportunity to hear from some of the leading people in a variety of technical fields. These are um, faculty, researchers, innovators, entrepreneurs, and it is just a, an amazing opportunity. So really take this chance to ask questions um, and be very engaged in, in the presentations. Um, today, we have Dr. Maria Illich. She is um, a professor emerita from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and currently she has two positions at MIT, one as a senior staff at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, which is where I work, and um, the second in the um, LIDS lab on, at the MIT campus, which is a laboratory for information and decision systems. Um, Dr. Illich is incredibly, has an incredibly distinctive career. Um, she is uh, the first recipient of the US recipient of the NSF President's uh, Young Investigator Award for Power Systems. Um, she's an IEEE Life Fellow, which is a very distinguished accomplishment. But perhaps most impressively, she is an elected member of the National Academy of Engineering and the Academy Europa, which is a, an honor that is reserved for people who have really made outstanding contributions in their fields over, over a very distinguished career. Um, she has a number of impressive publications. Um, and today she's going to talk to us about using smarts to make the um, energy network uh, work in a modern environment. So with this, I'm going to turn it over to Maria. Thank you for being here today. Thank you very much, Jen. And I'm really excited to be here to share with people uh, what I know about electricity services. It's an old field, but actually my idea today is to say that there is much more room for innovation and uh, that that uh, helps with solving some um, real life problem that the society worries about. So just to start with, I, I, I love this, um, this diagram. It's not mine. It was made by uh, late Eleanor Ostrom, who was the first woman um, to receive a Nobel Prize in economics. And she worked on this uh, general framework for analyzing what she was referring to as social ecological systems. So you have ecological systems, resources, and then you have different social users of those resources like uh, customers for water, for electricity, for gas, and so forth. And that all exists within one system, which is governed by uh, some sort of governance and the interactions between these things. So if I can in one uh, sentence say, what is the problem that I've been working on without knowing at the beginning what I was working on, but over the career, you sort of learn where you are going and, you, and the same is going to happen to all of you. Um, so the key problem at the end to solve is uh, how do you make the most out of available resources to meet energy users' needs? It's that simple. And making the most out of it, and you've been seeing in the media, we want to use clean resources, not to uh, affect uh, um, emissions and climate. And we also don't want to have interruptions. When I came to this country many years ago, my job was that I was sent to learn how to use the computer to prevent blackouts. So here you have a snapshot of Northeast US in 2003, when a couple of transmission lines were touched by trees and that triggered widespread blackout, the entire Northeast lost power. So how do you think about these type of problems so that you um, arrest, localize the effects of uh, equipment failures? And this has become much more also important, let's say in Puerto Rico, we recently worked at Lincoln Lab on how you would uh, manage to serve cri uh, critical customers during hurricanes, earthquakes, and so forth. So this is the, the general problem that we worry about. And um, just to begin to think about uh, the problem sort of conceptually, um, maybe the easiest way is to say, to think about power grid as something that has generation and uh, it has loads, these arrows are loads. And so you can have price responsive loads where loads adjust, 
or you have loads which customers who use electricity, no matter what it is, and they pay at the end of the month. And you have different type of resources. You have coal, natural gas. More recently, we have these wind uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, PVs, and so forth. So everything in green is more uh, something that contributes much more to clean electricity service. So to think about a power system, if you've never seen it before, it's just an electric power grid connected by wires and interconnecting different resources to customers. And uh, if you want to get a little deeper into what it is, on the generation side, you have different energy sources like water, coal, nuclear, and that gets converted into electrical and gets and gets transferred by a transmission and distribution wires to loads, and you have different type of loads. You need um, you need things for cooking, for cooling, for uh, for lights, for serving your computers, and so forth. So um, this is the commercial power system, the simplest one. You have one resource, you have the wire interconnecting resources to loads, and the loads convert electricity into different forms of work, basically. So you can think about power systems for people, you know, high school level. You can just from 101 physics, you can, you can conceptualize these things. And this is how I try to arrange it so that uh, it, you don't need any, any advanced concepts to really understand what are the challenges and what's happening. Now, we usually don't have just one generator, one load. You have many, many different generators. Like in the Northeast, you have power coming even all the way from Hydro-Quebec, hydropower coming into New England via Maine, into Boston, and so forth. So the grid becomes very complicated. You have a lot of interconnections. And usually, the power is transferred by what's known as extra high voltage level, 500 kilovolts. These wires are 500 kilovolts, 345 kilovolts. And the reason you do that is because if uh, you want to deliver some power to customers, some energy, and to deliver given power, the, the higher the voltage is, the lower the current through these wires is, and the less you lose electricity and heating. So that was the reason for transferring power by high voltage levels. But um, then you basically have the resources, step up transformers, which transform power to high voltage level. And then when you come closer to the end users, you have so called uh, step down transformers, which go down from 340 kV to 13 kV, 34 kV, all the way down to your home, 110 volts. So it's a very complicated hierarchical grid in which you have different uh, voltage levels and transformers interconnect different voltage levels. This is AC, uh, alternative current uh, power grid of today. Now this is changing. And the future power grids that everybody is talking about has many, many more types of loads because we connect with transportation. You have electric vehicles, you have responsive refrigerators, uh, washers, air conditioners, which respond to price of electricity and can reduce consumption when needed and so forth. So uh, on the resource side, we have solar, we have photovoltaic, we have uh, wind. So these are all clean sources of energy. And so the this power uh, grid is evolving from those conventional ones where you have coal, nuclear, hydro into having many, many more of distributed uh, clean resources. And uh, how is this system operated? Basically, uh, you have a control center. In New England, you have a, somewhere in Holyoke in Massachusetts, you have a control center where there is a dedicated measurement, supervisory control and data acquisition uh, network, which measures, uh, measures generation, the demand at these extra high voltage levels down to substation level. That means down to uh, 69 kV and not below. So there is no communication now. And this is important for understanding what's changing and you know, where the innovation can happen. The, the communications and control takes place only from 500 kV down to 69 kV, what's known as bulk power system. Below that, you have pre-programmed things. Customers use what they want to use and uh, at the end they pay. Uh, the electricity bills and the scheduling. So the operating problem that gets solved here 
at the control center level, ISO New England, independent system operator in New England, for example, predicts all these demand, uh, system demand, how much are customers likely to need based on the weather, based on the previous um, load patterns, and then schedules outputs from different generators so that um, power schedule uh, attempts to balance uh, uh, predicted demand. And of course, there is no perfect balancing, so you need a lot of automation to correct so that power has to balance and we get perfect uh, uh, 60 hertz AC uh, high quality power of service. So this is the basic thing that's happening now. And if we think about evolution in the system, uh, if we want to integrate some of these distributed resources and cleaner resources into and help balance uh, power that a system operator is now scheduling from these conventional larger power plants, then we need some more communications and more activity closer to the end users. This is where there is a lot of room for innovation. And I'll talk about that more. Uh, so basically, this gets very complicated in a hurry. As I said, at the high voltage level, you have the system operator communicates with load serving entities, with aggregators, with utilities. Utilities, um, you can have different areas, different transmission utilities. You have, um, you have Eversource, you have uh, National Grid, and they all are responsible for serving their customers lower at the distribution system level. So, Closer to the end user, you have distribution system operators which serve these uh, nodes network optimized in distributed energy systems. This is a new term that says that uh, you can aggregate a lot of loads and those loads, um, can, aggregated loads can uh, ask for how much they need, give more information to distribution system coordination. So this, there is much more activity now. These are new, these are dotted lines. So this information doesn't quite exist now and, um, uh, but this is what is happening. We are putting much more communications in between um, high voltage level, distribution level, da all the way down to residential neighborhoods, urban commercial complexes like Walmart and so forth. And then for uh, um, reliability, when you lose power from the conventional generators, then people are putting more and more these backup generators, small diesel power plants so that they serve themselves. If, not much comes from the distribution company. So this is basically how the system operates. And um, um, Lincoln Lab, for example, has been working a lot on microgrids. Uh, microgrids are these coordinated neighborhoods, um, um, commercial complexes and so forth, in which you have a lot of um, smart uh, end users who participate in balancing supply and demand. From the uh, conceptual point of view, how to manage this system, things are getting harder because you have much more spatial complexity. You have to manage everything from the control center down to the microgrids and neighborhoods. And there are multiple layers uh, which um, need to be coordinated for everything to balance, for supply uh, to balance uh, demand and for power to be delivered to the right place. So, as I mentioned before, uh, right now you only have this communication SCADA backbone uh, only down to 69 kV. So there is no uh, multi-participant information exchange at the lower voltage levels. And so a lot of people are working on how to further add communications and intelligence into these lower levels so that they participate in um, more flexible energy processing and uh, contribute to, to electricity services. So that, this is a new technical problem that a lot of people are working on. And what's very interesting is in the old industry, you had this control center, which worries about scheduling supply to meet given anticipated demand and deliver uh, wants to deliver power, assuming to predefined predefin tariff and deliver power subject to CO2 constraint, they cannot emit more than what is allowed by regulation and so forth. Now this is changing because you have a lot of distributed end users. So for supply to meet demand, 
you know, there are these um, big functions, uh, non-utility owners of um, energy resources, for example, they can say, I want to sell so much at that price. And the demand can say, I want to buy so much at that price. So basically, this becomes a decision at the, at the distributed level on how much to consume and to begin to link it with economics. Then uh, how much to deliver power. Uh, that actually is determined by how much customers are willing to pay. So there's all this feedback coming from the end users to, uh, and it's making the, the scheduling more complicated, but also ultimately, hopefully, will, uh, would contribute to solving this problem that we stated at the beginning, that you can balance supply and demand yeah, through everybody's participation in the most, um, most um, sustainable way and without interruptions. So uh, what we've been working on at Lincoln Lab at, on campus for many years, I've been working on how to have, now the question is, how are you going to do this? The operator doesn't know every little uh, nitty gritty detail. So they are enabled by different models and different software that advises. There is still human in the loop, but uh, the software advises operators what to do, or um, now we have much more uh, embedded software into end users, and um, that also helps uh, with the decisions at different levels. So when it comes to learning how to model and how to define this software, the question is, how can you have sufficiently accurate, but not too complex modeling framework, which captures these interdependencies of energy, social, ecological system, like Eleanor Osnum was thinking about. She worked primarily in water systems, but you have so much of ecological resources, societal needs as such, and you need to now capture these interdependencies and manage them as conditions change. And um, one thing that I want to share with you a little bit on, okay, what have I learned in high school that can be directly used and useful for what we are talking about is these different layers of um, complex power system can be thought of as a sort of zooming in and zooming out model. In, and if you zoom out, there are utilities that are interacting through physical powerful exchanges, through information exchange, through regulatory rules. But if you zoom in, in the neighborhood, you know, you, you, um, end users can help each other if one has solar, the other doesn't. So the question is, how do you represent that interaction in your mathematical models? And um, so what we've been working on, I started at the CMU with several former grad students and we are continuing here at MIT. I'll show you, we actually have a sort of digital twin version zero, which is based on these concepts. So instead of always modeling the entire system as a flat system, you model it as a multi-layer system in which you utilize this notion of interaction variables so to design the information communication uh, system to, to manage these interaction variables uh, becomes the, the base idea, basic idea where uh, you relate engineering, finance, and environmental objectives. So keep in mind this idea of interaction variable. So what that means physically, that interaction variable physically means I have one utility, another utility, each one is, has some generator that are producing has its own load and the other utility it has the same, but they are physically interconnected. So how do you coordinate them? You coordinate them by coordinating these exchanges of energy, power, rate of change of power that they exchange. This is how you go back to 101 physics. So if we can capture in our mathematical models just that much, then we can coordinate them. Then we can zoom in and characterize each, um, each, control, uh, each uh, subsystem in terms of what it can do and uh, then design internal intelligence uh, so that that happens and it can happen with different technologies and so forth. So interaction variable is uh, quite powerful 
concept for zooming in and zooming out, modeling complex dynamics of complex systems at the right level of detail. And this is the new thing that we've been doing for a very long time now, 10, 15 years. So basically, if you look now into power exchange between two areas over time, you see interaction variable. Don't have to zoom, look into every single household. And um, so these are variables associated with subsystems, which can only be affected by interactions with the other subsystems and not by the action taken at the subsystem level. So there is a lot of math which goes into proving that, but it is very interesting because um, dynamics of physical interaction variables is zero when the system is disconnected from other subsystems. So everybody can do their own control, their own uh, decisions. And then through the higher level model in terms of these interaction variables, you can actually now uh, model the, how they affect each other and control them. So returning to the first slide that I showed you, uh, it is uh, quite interesting here to, to understand that it's not just physical interaction variables, but if you go to Eleanor Ostrom's um, chart about social ecological systems, resources, users, governance system, they all interact. So they are social, they're environmental, they're physical interactions, and the best design for IT and uh, communications is the design that captures through models and through information exchange these interactions so they align. So basically you do the technical design for best um, environmental effects between the users and the system level and so forth. So um, now I just have one semi-technical slide that I want to share with you. So what is the basic idea underlying these interaction variables? Instead of, if you think about what we have in these complex power systems, you have wind, you have coal. So nobody has, is an expert on all of them because you have different types of energy conversion, different technical designs and so forth. So how can you actually now uh, establish information technology exchange and control and software for these systems? Do you have to go technology by technology or you can actually have some more unified modeling and, um, and monitoring system. So uh, this is something that yes, has evolved over time in our group, but um, the interaction variable that I mentioned between two subsystems is very closely related to understanding what we refer to as energy-based dynamical models. I'm sure in high school, you know, energy power, rate of change of power. So it's what we have in power grid in the past has been, we have this electric grid that I showed you and have conventional generators and they have some inertia, they move, they respond to the disturbances like according to second Newton's law. And now things are getting more complicated because you have a lot of power electronics controlling solar PVs, uh, at the demand side, you have water heater controlled by, uh, by some thermal control and uh, H, uh, high, uh, HVACs and so forth. So these guys have the, something that a lot of people are working on modeling these because they are not conventional power systems. Um, models uh, where you just say that the generator moves according to second Newton's law, it has some inertia. Um, here, people introduce, if you think about there is a control of the solar plant and uh, nothing is moving there, but people are still introducing the notion of synthetic inertia and trying to emulate uh, the dynamics of how um, power electronically controlled solar PV, for example, will respond dynamically to some uh, request and uh, produce power or um, a different rate. So there is this very strange situation in which you have conventional models, which are well understood for electromechanical dynamics, in which you understand speed of rotation, frequency, voltage. And then you have also these newer technologies where it's sort of hard to, to map uh, what the, the way we model conventional electromechanical 
devices in, uh, to, to what we model when you have different uh, types of energy conversion. So what we have done over the years, uh, and actually it's evolved over time, it didn't happen in one step, but um, one can realize that instead of just thinking about very specific technology about the generation or inverter control solar, what is needed is to understand there is what this system is a heterogeneous end-to-end -end conversion process. Uh, and uh, if you understand what the energy conversion is, in other words, rather than thinking in terms of is it speed or is it, um, is it radiance on solar, you want to think about these things, each of them as black boxes, how much energy they can produce. And since when you connect these components, when you connect them, they all have to satisfy the power conservation. In other words, power coming out has to be the same as, as power uh, going somewhere else, uh, going in. And um, so we need to also have um, the state variable uh, being power, which is rate of change of stored energy in the components. And then this became new. Um, since we, in these new systems, we have, let's say, if you look at the solar radiance, it varies over time. This is the output from PV array. It varies all the time, and then it can jump if you have cloud. However, if you think about system demand in, in time, you know, it's pretty, pretty smooth because loads sort of average their consumption, and operator sees things, uh, the net system for we, uh, system load for which they need to do schedule conventional generation, it's pretty slow. However, now in this new industry, we have to mix resources which change very fast, with resources that change slowly and the system load changes slowly. And because of that, uh, what is happening in this new system, this is a new dynamical phenomena for which the control is challenging. And I'm working with my group quite a bit on this. The thing is that not all power produced can be delivered fundamentally due to mismatch in rates at which energy conversion processes of connected components take place, even if you don't worry about thermal. So basically, there is some energy conversion in solar, there is some energy conversion in large power plants, and they start in, in, in exchanging power at certain rates. There is some dynamics, inter-area dynamics between them. And, um, uh, the protection of these devices and uh, has been done such that if there are some oscillations, then the relays, protective relays will disconnect components and that can actually lead uh, to blackout. So if you, if we manage to model these interactions between different components in terms of these general things, this is all what we need from physics, energy, power, and rate of change of reactive power can be rate of change of instantaneous power. So this is a technical detail that we can talk in details maybe in the Q&A. But this is the triplet that defines anything, any exchange, any interaction variable here. And what, um, what we have shown mathematically that the rate of change of this interaction variable is zero when you disconnect the component from the rest of the system. So you have one-to-one -one alignment between some very fundamental straightforward modeling in terms of energy, power, and rate of change of power, which does, it's sort of technology agnostic and you begin to understand what's happening in terms of dynamical interactions within the, this complex system. So we now think about unified component specifications and interaction conditions in energy space. So that when you start putting these components together, this is what's happening in this new world. Everybody wants to produce something, to connect, plug and play. And so some students have been working. It's actually quite exciting that if you characterize whatever is in your black box can be solar controlled by power electronics, can be conventional generator, can be controllable load, you think of it as being characterized in terms of, let's say, high power, rate of change of high power, rate of change of power at the high power level, rate of change of low power level. So this is, a, all these components become smart hardware 
and they can have uh, they can have control saturation, but one has to be aware of that. But think about all these black boxes. Although you are not an expert in power systems, this is all what you need to know to begin to think about uh, um, uh, checking the problem and uh, getting into the field. And what's interesting is. I don't have time to go over that, but the course that I offered in the spring and now it's an open source course, 6 to 47, you can, if you're interested, you can follow up on that. Um, there, you can actually show that the conventionally used model for these very complex multi-layered power systems, multi-voltage levels with transformers that I showed you, they end up, uh, if you want to think about that mathematically, they end up in a lot of coupled differential algebraic equations, which are hard to simulate and hard to control and so forth. If you start thinking about the problem as modules interconnecting through these interaction variables and understanding, trying to capture and trying to control uh, how they exchange power and what rate, then everything becomes much more transparent. And I explained in the course that quite a bit, but for example, an example here, it doesn't matter if it's controllable household or is a power plant, sufficient condition to have completely new power systems, your microgrid in the neighborhood or whatever you want to design is that controlled components in closed loop, when you control them locally, they have to be dissipative. In other words, they uh, have they cannot be active devices. And then you could have, uh, and then uh, the other thing is when you start connecting them, cumulative power over time that comes into component has to be larger than what comes out of the component. So the component is dissipative. And so simple conditions like this that can be checked even if you want to create an architecture where you have a just microgrid at the neighborhood level, um, we can develop the um, exchange protocols, almost like internet-like protocols in which uh, different components exchange the information and decide if when they connect, they can work in a feasible way and stay stable or not. This is a fundamental change of operating paradigm um, when you go from centralized top-down control of just bulk power system in which you schedule conventional power generation to meet anticipated demand just at the 69 kV level and not deeper into having a distributed near optimal control and intelligence embedded into everything uh, all the way down to your household. So that, there is an open R&D and a lot of people are working on that. So now one can conceptualize what is the smart grid with all this background. Smart grid is you have energy, social, ecological system, the resources, generation, electric users, and there is a man-made grid that interconnects them, that's the grid. You have physical network connecting energy generation and consumers, and it's needed to implement in these interactions if you want to think about that at the conceptual level, but uh, man-made information communication technologies these smarts that are added to the physical grid and embedded into different components, sensor communications, algorithms for operations, for decision and control, protection, when to disconnect the equipment, they all needed to align these interactions so the system stays stable, feasible. So this is a quite different way of thinking about power systems than um, it has been done in the past. And, um, we, we have actually to do that, to achieve that, um, that new world where, where you enable different components to participate in electricity service, we have to develop, this is all what can be done after you get out of high school and teach, uh, learn about a little more about these things. You can develop models of power systems, control software. You can incorporate security communication, save its systems. And what is very important is that that all has to be done through simulations, through modeling, through software before you actually deploy completely new hardware because that's a slow process. So over the years, what we have done, we have developed um, our um, framework, which we call Dynamic Monitoring and Decision Systems Framework, which is basically an extension of, remember I showed you SCADA, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition System, that 
currently goes only from very high voltage level from control center down to substations to uh, 69 kb. But uh, what we have now is basically diamonds enabled physical grid, and this is a sort of cartoon um, that illustrates that in which you embed intelligence into conventional, unconventional uh, components, but also there is information exchange between them. And uh, in order not to make these information exchange and communications too complex, we rely on these interaction variables. So you see the blue dotted lines is the today's information exchange from very high voltage level down to substation, where there is a lot of development is how the distribution grids, your local company, how does it communicate down to your household? What information do you send through internet to, to distribution grids so your bill is um, uh, lower or you participate in clean uh, electricity utilization and so forth? So these red dotted lines, this is um, complements uh, today's SCADA. And the other thing that's very interesting is Today's SCADA is sort of top down. The control, the utility measures things and anticipates demand and so forth. Um, the, the, to enable the participation in a, a sort of distributed way in which all of these technologies with their intelligence participate, you have to have multi directional information exchange. And um, where we have made the connection in our research over the years is. This has been a million dollar question for research, for a lot of grad students. What is the minimum information that you need to exchange for this to work? And it boils down to the concept of these interaction variables that I explained. So we have multi-layered modeling. When you want to design control of your EV, you zoom in and you have to know the technology of the vehicles and their specialists who design that control. But when EV has to tell the distribution company, how much they want to participate in, let's say, uh, smoothing out as storage, as I'll show you in a minute, uh, smoothing out the peak load because their load, they could create more load than contribute to burning wires in the, in, the, in the distribution grid. If they want to say how much they want to participate, they basically have to say what energy over which time and what power and what rate of of uh, exchange of power, that's good enough for the system, the higher layer to actually decide who is going to be do, uh, doing what on the system. So it's minimal coordination with a lot of embedded intelligence. Um, if I don't have time to ma mention that later, I want to just say that an interesting thing is that um, a lot of complexity, managing uncertainties, risk, uh, preferences, choice, that all can be embedded as uh, these different technologies and different stakeholders participating in electricity service uh, decide how much they want to sell and at what rate or consume and at what rate and what price. Um, so the complexity of deciding on even on the environmental impact and so forth is actually moved to this distributed level and there is minimal coordination just to make sure that the system works and uh, some societal objective is met. So there is, so this is the picture that's emerging. You have these generators with a lot of communications, loads are changing, phasor measurement units, you have control. So the Northeast looks like this. This is New York, very uh, sort of sketchy uh, thing of New York power grid connected to New England, connected to Ontario and uh, communication, potential communications for managing voltage at pilot points, for example, main points in the, in the grid. So this is where uh, the effort is at the bulk power system level. Uh, so the, the main takeaway here is that one can have a modular, multi-layered modeling which supports interactive information exchange in terms of variables common to physical and market processes. Once you understand that, and that has been a long way for us to, to get there, is then you can think about this system just as basically complex grid with uh, different interactive elements. And um, we view the physical system as the dynamical system with lots of structure. 
if you understand that structure, then you can design the power control and communications for some provable performance. So then the market looks like we have electricity markets, system users say how much they want to uh, consume, uh, produce and at what price these are their bid functions and system operator gets all those bid functions and clears the market. And this is how the market works in terms of, um, uh, in terms of accommodating different resources now, including demand response and storage. So there are these bid functions which say, for example, if I have generator wants to produce power from between some minimum and maximum value at certain fixed price, but PHEV wants to behave as a demand and this is at how much it's willing to pay for it. Price responsive demand can participate and so forth. In elastic demand says, I'm just going to use so much power no matter what the price is. So just as a side comment, which is actually a very important uh, comment and a lot of people are working on that in, uh, in designing electricity markets, prices are right now pretty much uh, for day ahead or hour ahead in um, real they, what they call real time market is hour ahead, 15 minutes ahead of time, characterizing energy. What we are working on and a lot of people are recognizing that you have to have long term market signals for investments, but also you need to get the, to differentiate between which technologies contribute to what um, time over which power balances and so that the system stays together, you have to have the characterization of power and rate of change of power. And that again connects with the idea of, um, of interaction variables that I talked about. So um, this is basically the challenge. And uh, for somebody at your stage, I wish I were the same age as you are now because it wasn't that exciting before, but now you, you can look into the, the mathematical modeling simulations, numerical methods to simulate these systems. You have physical system. How would you design the IT so that this system is smart and so forth? This is where the field is going. And so we have these emerging systems with the advent of Internet of Things effectively. You can think about these diamonds as basically a lot of embedded intelligence where you have extended excessive data collection, storage, uh, and, uh, and you, you basically do all that processing locally. You can do machine learning about the environment, about what you want, what are your preferences. So it's the connection with AI and machine learning is amazing because it is much easier to do these things at the distributed level than at the large centralized level. So just to tell you very quickly that at MIT, started at CMU, but at MIT now we have developed these diamonds-based computer platform, which it's scalable platforms, which aligns embedded spatial and temporal hierarchies with the computer architecture. So different students have designed different things. Uh, for example, one student did integration of electric vehicles into the grid and the interactions. You have um, you, you, the, the communications and the platform actually can connect households with the cloud and have in the cloud, you have the coordination. And uh, so this is what we have. I am saying it's sort of version zero still, but we are quite excited about having this emulation of what's happening in the system and how it's operated all modeled and simulated. And to do that, you have uh, information exchange architecture that I described. So let me show you just very quickly. Um, this, what does this diamond simulator, for example, can show you on the IEEE, the reliability, this is the test system. So it used to be that this test system had a lot of conventional power plants, these generators with the wiggles, the blue things, these are all conventional. This is a conventional IEEE system. And now you want to add 20%, 50% of wind, and you want to see how is this system going to work. So you can modularly add these things and see that, for example, if wind has the predictions and smooths out itself, then you need much less natural gas to balance the system. And that can be done in a distributed model predictive way, or you can be done using, if you do conventional static 
scheduling, okay, for this moment, the wind is spiking, I need to put a lot of natural gas to balances, that's not very good because you are going to have to need a lot of natural gas. So you have to schedule these things according to their rates at which they can produce power. And the other interesting thing is that even slow conventional plants like coal units, they can, in a model predictive way, they know they are ahead, for example, what is the load pattern going to be. They can ramp up slowly. They don't have to turn on and off all the time like they are doing now, shown with this blue curve. And um, some students have done work to show how it's sort of the benchmark when you do centralized predictive dispatch versus distributed according to diamonds, how do they compare? They actually come very close, the red and black, um, follow each other. However, this static conventional dispatch is really not good for slow power plants because they cannot participate in a compensating wind. We have this problem, for example, in California with solar. So, but there is there are other interesting things that you can see with this simulator. In addition, so you add wind, and now you have you have to either schedule the resources in a clever way and you can need the fast natural gas plants which move fast to compensate that wind or you can actually begin to have price responsive demand. This is where the customers come in. So all these dotted lines, these are the price responsive elastic demand that responds, for example, to time varying price. So demand or aggregators, neighborhoods can give you the price at which they will reduce how much power they consume in order to, to save on the electricity bill, but indirectly when they reduce that, they also help balance power at the interconnected system level. So um, the same thing is you can think about the link with transportation. The electric vehicles are nothing else, but could be thought of as price responsive demand. So they are there. And um, this is a typical thing that you might in somewhere where people worry about electric vehicles, they say, well, utility worries, they're going to have very big uh, demand for electricity when people charge the electric vehicles. And because of that, they need to build new power plants, new transmission distribution and so forth. But if you have smart charging, embedded intelligent into that, you actually don't have to do that. This is huge gain from embedding smarts into, into these distributed resources. And just to show here, if you want to integrate 10% electric vehicles or 40% electric vehicles to participate, uh, if you do it in a smart way, you shape this original inelastic system demand becomes smaller and uh, depending on who participates. So you have a renewable energy output, but other components are um, participating in balancing so you can still have a lot of renewable resources and not have to build much more. We did a long st uh, study several years ago between MIT, CMU and Portugal uh, collaboration on this is the Flores Island in Azores Islands. It's very interesting example of what one can do very quickly. So you have an island in which most of the islands are like this. You have diesel plant, you have some hydro plant, and there is some wind, but the objective would be, if you want to make this uh, microgrid of the future, you want to replace these dirty diesel fuels uh, whose fuel is very expensive because fuel is being imported to the islands, um, replace that with wind. And the question is, can I control hydro? Can I control wind? with this embedded intelligence in addition to controlling diesel, which is now controlled. And you do all this type of modeling that we were talking about and control design, and you show that um, this actually is very doable. There is a reference here, if you're interested in time monograph on us using uh, Azores Island data and showing how you can transform without increasing long-term costs, probably is the first example of deploying 100% um, wind on an island and serving 100% wind with some flywheels uh, so that um, and long-term electricity cost doesn't go up at all. So this is a sort of first of their kind examples of what you can do uh, by making something out of nothing the, the, rather than 
just building more and more hardware. And uh, just to show you, this is also from the island. If you want to have, um, you have to integrate, you want to integrate wind and solar and um, depending on if you have controlled electric vehicles or uncontrolled electric vehicles, you remember uncontrolled is creating big peak or you don't have electric vehicles. What happens here, you see these purple things, you spill a lot of wind generation. You cannot uh, balance the system if you don't have the storage from controllable electric vehicle. So there is a huge potential benefit if we do the smart uh, control of the electric vehicles, right? And we showed this again with some real data that uh, one of the PhD students did for uh, Azores Islands. Just the last thing to mention is that there are many, many different ways of balancing supply demand. And one thing that I didn't talk very much about is uh, when you have a response for customers, from end users. So basically, you need this generation to balance um, the balance supply and anticipated demand. If you have response by consumers, uh, they will actually cut the net demand, as I've shown you. And um, the challenges, the interesting challenges, and a lot of people are working on this, is that a lot of these um, demand side uh, equipment like compressors, furnaces, electric vehicles, electric water heaters, they have very stochastic use and it's hard to control them. So um, again, going back to the fundamentals, uh, what, we are, what we want to do, we want to control how much power is consumed by these customers when uh, you want to have thermal stored energy in water or you have chemical to charge your electric vehicle or um, to control the temperature. And it goes back to, if you understand the fundamentals of energy power, rate of change of power and work in that modeling um, uh, environment, I think you can understand much better what is possible rather than if you get into nitty gritty details of how is each component designed. So, so the different energy domain makes modeling for a sure and probable grid side performance very difficult, uh, and, but it, um, it, we also, it also needs to satisfy end user's requirement. You have to drive when you need to drive and temperature should be, the comfort should be uh, acceptable. So the last thing here is we just finished an MIT uh, Lincoln Lab project that was done for ARPAE on um, demonstrating the participation of some of this demand, controllable demand in Texas. And it was this is neighborhood that participates in, um, in these experiments. And the um, uh, Pecan Street company helped us work with uh, representing these things and showing that, for example, at the end, this was the the thing that we wanted to show that if you have 100 electric water heaters in the neighborhood, uh, following uncertain variation in solar energy injections, you can, if with the right control, with the right embedded intelligence, you can do that and follow pretty well, uh, balance the power with um, controllable water heaters and HVACs on the demand side. And um, what is interesting is if you have to do this, the control problem, the intelligence, and this component level is hard because you have to do that while you still observe the temperature and comfort at the end user's level. So to, to, to conclude, uh, we compared, when you compare to the 90s, we now have large amounts of sensor data available, sufficient computation, communication resources. We have advancements in adapting IoT uh, it has been slow, but you know the the research that I've shared with you and ideas they basically could help us uh, move uh, the move the electric power systems to making it much more sustainable and uh, avoiding uh, situations like we have like widespread blackouts during extreme events and so forth. So thank you very much. So this is golden era to pursue interdisciplinary research in this area. This is my ad. Okay. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, there are a lot of questions and we're not gonna be able to get to all of them, but 
Um, I'll, I'm going to pick out a couple to, to maybe, um, if you could, if you could. So again, I, to say, I would be, I would be extremely helpful if you share them with me. I'll answer them offline and. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. We'll, we've, we'll record the chat and we'll um, share this with you and with the students. But um, Isita uh, Talukdar, yeah. would you like yeah. to unmute and ask your question about maybe some of the current or more recent events? Sure. Yes, yeah, so I was wondering about like how would the system accommodate for situations like what happened in Texas, the power cuts are like, I'm from California, so like we have to have power mandatory power cuts because of the wildfire season so I was wondering like how does that kind of like intersect with natural phenomena that unfortunately we can't really control so this is very interesting question thank you Sita so Texas although people say that Texas is completely disconnected Texas is actually connected to the rest of the grid so with a little better intelligence and this is something that I'm very fond of you can actually schedule power from Midwest and deliver to Texas during when the natural gas was not available. Um, so one has to explore how much more you could have actually delivered to customers. That's the first thing. Um, the second one is um, we have to differentiate between the situation when you have natural disaster or you have normal conditions. During normal conditions, you blast your usage with everything. So we have to have the system in which end users have enough incentives to actually adjust, to minimize things over a prolonged time. So the demand response, as I was showing, it uh, could help big way in, in, um, in still having the service during extreme events, uh, but not, uh, not completely you know, uh, lose power in an uncontrolled way. So um, it, it is a study that needs to be done and everybody's blaming on the regulatory things, on pricing, but maybe the signals were not right. But this is why we are talking about, okay, how do you align the, the signal for something technical that has to be done to supply something that is really required at the point and give the right, um, right signal. So aligning regulation with serving during extreme events for reliability and for resiliency, it's a very hot topic and people are actually working on that, but there are a lot of different opinions. So there is, uh, people are not agreeing on everything because as you said, in California, you can have, you have to have 100% everything or it's mandated disconnect mandated is not good because the utility just tells you when to disconnect it is much better to have a choice that you make with your intelligence say this is when i want to disconnect but just give me a signal on ahead of time in a model predictive way and that goes a very long way okay. i hope that answers the question yeah that was really insightful thank you for answering my question i'll, I'll follow up if you send me an email you have an email i'll be very happy to give you more references and so forth Thank you so much. Sure. So maybe we'll we'll take one more because we're a little bit short on time. But um, Pippi, would you like to unmute and ask your question about carbon neutral the push towards carbon neutrality? Sure. Um, that made me think about carbon neutra uh, neutrality goal recently that was uh, published. Um, so I think for based on the presentation that you just shared, I feel like the U.S. also are heavily still heavily dependent on carbon-based fuels. So I was wondering the goal for carbon neutrality in the U.S. in the near future has an impact on the current system. Yeah. Um, so my personal take at this is that uh, we can actually become much more carbon neutral with what we have and then gradually assess what are the things that need to be changed over time. So we have to, we cannot change like on and off right now to replace everything with, um, with clean. As I was explaining in, in, the note, uh, in the slide that I was sharing, you know, um, I, this course that I teach, it basically says you can do digitalization for decarbonization. What does that mean? You can get smart at different levels and sort of um, everybody, it's just like a law of large numbers. Everybody picks in a little bit something, uh, kicks in and uh, you contribute quite a bit to cutting down things when 
um, when the pollution is the highest or you, you, you are running these things. Oh, the other thing I should say, I didn't have time to say it's extremely important, is today's operation by the utility is that uh, they call this worst case reserve thing. So if you operate now, you still want to have enough reserve in case some large generator fails, right? If you change the operator, uh, what that means is that uh, you cannot utilize the cleanest in real time or the cheapest because you have to keep the reserve when it's needed and it's how much. What, um, uh, what makes a lot of sense would be to make it much more flexible reserve to rely on data enabled decision tools. So when, when the contingency happens, you very quickly have a tool which tells you what constraint to relax, what, uh, what's remaining to activate. And so going from preventive to flexible reserves, uh, half of um, researchers are working on that now. That means cumulatively day after day, you are, not, you are going to use something dirty, although you don't have to, or expensive. So it's a sort of, um, at the end of the day, is devil in the details. You know, if you catch all of those, you can cumulatively gain a lot. So I really don't believe in um, capacity-based thinking. You replace all of that suddenly with something clean. It's just, uh, it has to be taught dynamically through different implications. And uh, otherwise, um, it, some planning has to be done. And I think where young people come in is, how do you do those assessments through simulations, through modeling, so that you, you have the advisory tool which saying, over the next 10 years, this makes sense, rather than just say, I'm going to put 40% wind and so forth. So I, I, as you can say, I see I'm a little biased on that, but uh, it, it just cannot be done. We replace everything with clean resources of that capacity. In particular, wind has capacity, but most of the time doesn't blow. That's why you need storage and electric vehicles. So you have to manage them all carefully. Thank you so much. Good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I'd like to um, turn it over to our team in Alabama. Um, and we have a couple of students who would like to present you with a, a thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, my name is Faith. And I'm Caleb. And um, we just wanted to thank you for um, the seminar. It was very interesting. And we would like to present you with a virtual t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> which has teleported and we can see you're, you're wearing it with appreciation today. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maria, this was excellent. Thank you. And, and we, will, um, we will save all the questions for you and share them with you. Best of luck to everybody, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone, we will see you. I will see you tomorrow for tomorrow's um, next installment of the seminar. Have a great day. Okay, bye-bye.